Hi, I'm Scott Hanselman, and we're back here at the Intermediate ASP.NET Core 1.0. I'm Jeff Fritz, and why don't we take a look at, at JavaScript services and a little bit with Angular 2 in this yeah. module. In the previous module, we made a web API, but you want to be able to call those from somewhere. Yeah, right, and Angular 2 really seems like the, the cool new way here in 2016 to build JavaScript applications to work with APIs and present a really good browser-based application. Absolutely. So we've actually got some things that are available in the NPM, the Node Package Manager environment that you can use to build applications using Angular and ASP.NET Core. Mm -hmm. So let me go to the console here on my machine and let's take a look at how we can start to use some of these tools like Yeoman and our ASP.NET Core SPA framework to start to build an application. Mm -hmm. So Yeoman in this case is kind of acting as file new project. Yeah. In, yeah. The, uh, in the previous uh, introductory portion of .NET Core, we talked about .NET new, mm -hmm. how you can go .NET new dash T, the oh, command yeah. line, and do things like web. But for more sophisticated, more complex and things that use Yeoman, that use Bower, you would use uh, that generator rather than uh, .NET New. Right. Yeoman is, is really, it's the template generator, it's the scaffolding tool that the folks in the Node.js community use. And we're going to use it to make an ASP.NET Core app. We're going to use it to make an ASP.NET Core app with Angular. All right. That's cool. Cool. So here I am at the command line on my machine. Now, I've already got Yeoman installed, mm -hmm. but I can install both Yeoman and my generator for the ASP.NET SPA framework by saying npm install dash g, this is a global thing that we want installed, mm -hmm. and yo is my first item here. Yo is the reference for the Yeoman tool. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's also then I can specify generator ASP.NET SPA. Okay. This is another package that I can request that installs the templates that Yeoman will use mm -hmm. to scaffold my application. Now, I've already installed these, so we don't have to go through and watch the download and installation of these tools. But the dash G is important so that these tools are available no matter where I am on my machine, no matter what folder mm -hmm. I'm operating within. Mm -hmm. Uh, the other tool that I need is Webpack. Webpack is a um, it's a library minification and uh, concatenation tool, right? So we've used things like Gulp and Grunt in the past with ASP.NET Core and with Node.js to run some tasks that are going to be putting together client-side resources. Okay. Webpack is is the new tool that we're using to make those things happen, and it's not. Uh, it's Microsoft that is recommending using Webpack. Okay. This is the new recommendation in the Node.js. So it's like as if, as MS Build is our server side build, Webpack is our client side build. Yep, yep. But really, and it's focused on just that task of concatenating and minifying our CSS and JavaScript components. Okay. So I would use this command to install Webpack once again. Dash G to make sure that it's global and is available anywhere I'm working on disk. Okay. Cool. So. That's already installed on my machine. I'm not going to go through and let you watch that install on the video here. All right. So now I can actually build my application by saying yo ASP.NET Core SPA. Now this is going to start the Yeoman generator, and it's going to allow me to go and start choosing frameworks and how I want to build my application. So we have these menus that we can start working with, and I'm going to choose Angular 2 in this case. Mm -hmm. I can specify the name of my project, so I'll call it MVA, and it creates all of these files for me very, very quickly. And now we're going to restore content from the various package managers, from NPM, from Bower, and make them available and accessible to our application. Now, when we started in the introduction day, we had .NET new, and we ended up with program.cs. Mm -hmm. And over the course of that day, we went and we added uh, Hello World. We added, you know, a console app. We made it Hello World on the web. We added Kestrel. Then we went and we made that say Hello World on the web with a string, and then with JSON. And we're getting bigger and bigger and adding oh, more yeah. and more stacks. Uh, we made an empty web app in Visual Studio that didn't have controller folders and view folders and things like that. And then we made a full file new project and made an MVC app. It got bigger and bigger, and there were more and more folders and more and more 
um, conventions, more and more prescriptions. Yes. Oh, yes. Would you say that this uh, particular uh, scaffolder that was made uh, by Steve Sanderson and the team is even more kind of like formal and more prescribed because you've got not just controllers and, and views and models, but you've got prescription on the client side, you've got TypeScript, yeah. you've got a whole build yeah. system, you've got NPM. Check that out up here. You can see TypeScript is coming in here. Mm -hmm. TypeScript, of course, compiling into JavaScript. Right, right. So we've got some things around distribution format for some of our JavaScript and CSS. Right. Presumably we have the builds as well to go and build our JavaScript and compress it, minify it, yep. uh, to clean up our CSS as well. So there's a build process now that is both server-side and client-side. Yep. yep, absolutely. All right. So then that went and restored the NPM stuff. Yep. That can be a bit uh, tedious and long depending on... Uh, how busy that service is. And your network connection, of course. Mm -hmm. So now it's restoring our NuGet packages. So our .NET server-side components are being restored and mapped into our application. Okay. Hopefully that did not take as long. It looks like it didn't. So then once that's ready to go, does the application kind of just run out of the box? Or do I, can I open it up in any IDE? So we can open it up in any IDE, and this runs cross-platform. I can because this is all JavaScript and Node.js. I can run this on, yeah. on and a Mac or Linux. Yep. So there, we just ran our Webpack to package up all of our files that we received, mm -hmm. and okay. now I'm off and running. I can start working with this application. Okay. But of course, I, I'm running from the command line, so I want to make sure that my command line knows that I'm running in development mode. Maybe you could jump in and out because the uh, the color has changed to yeah, dark. Yeah. Look at that. Dark green. I find that a lot of these tools that make these changes in colors, uh, sometimes they they'll drop out and they'll lose your green. Yeah, they don't clean up too well. There we are. Okay. So now I'm going to set the environment variable for the ASP.NET Core environment to let it know that we are running in development. Ah, okay. This is the same one as before, the one that we see when we right click in Visual Studio and say properties. Yep. Yep, it's, except we're going to set it now as an environment variable that all processes can see. Okay. There it is. Now I can run my application. But I want to run this so that as I make changes, the application restarts on its own, mm -hmm. right? Um, we see a little bit of that with Visual Studio. There's a tool that's running here called .NET Watch. Okay. I don't, I don't yep. know if we covered that in any of the earlier yeah, modules. We did cover that in the introductory day. Okay. We talked about the relationship between .NET Watch and how it wraps .NET Run. Okay. So let's, let's do that now. I'm going to run .NET Watch Run, and it's going to start up and boot my application here, and then watch if there's anything that changes. Okay. Now, I have Visual Studio Code over here pointed to that folder with all my source code laid out. All right. Let's make sure this started. There it is. So it's my development environment, and it's listening on 5000. All right. There we go. And here's all of my code. All right. So I have this very simple application built that has all the hookups for Angular 2, mm -hmm. TypeScript, Webpack, and Bootstrap layout and formatting all running here on my application. And there's a simple set of tools here to demonstrate some of the features. There's a simple Angular 2 component here to count. So I can click this button and it counts. And that's a client-side count, not it's a server-side side. one like we did with our requests middleware. Right. Let's take a look at this. I'm going to bring up the, um, the debugger, the developer tools. I'm going to go over to the Network tab. And I'm going to click my increment button. And you can see it is not hitting the network. Okay, that's only changing some uh, client-side in-memory JavaScript. Yep, uh, it's only changing things in memory. All right. So, okay, that's pretty simple. That's Angular 2 at work. All right, well, the, the, the counter, the incrementing counter is, is cute, but it, sure. it's still just in memory, like we said. Uh, I see fetch data, though. That sounds like that's some meat. Yeah, we're actually going to work with some APIs. We're actually going to connect back to the server and interact with it in this demo. So let me go into like the web APIs that we did in the previous module. Exactly. Yep. So let me show you the fetch data sample that's in this default template that we get. Mm -hmm. So when I click on fetch data, we see it says loading, and then I get this table of data that's loaded. Ah, it's, right. There was a moment there where it was blank. Yeah. It was almost this. like in web forms where there's empty template and then data template. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just saying. So there's a, there's a moment there where it loaded, it did something, 
and then the data up here. And it came up. Okay. So now let's go over to the source code and see what, what built this. Okay. So I'm using Visual Studio Code for this. Mm -hmm. So in this case, um, we actually only have a home controller right now that has an index mm -hmm. server side. Got to make sure we delineate between these. And we have our index to support Angular here. Mm -hmm. All of our content for the Angular scripts are in this vendor JS. Okay. That's packed up and managed by Webpack. The content of that drives an app HTML and an app TypeScript, and here's where our router content will be dropped, right here. Mm -hmm. Going further then, the fetch data sample, here's the HTML, and now we start to see our Angular ah. uh, attributes and directives. That so we when, work you, with. when you clicked fetch data, this got swapped in over the top of that div, and that's and, th and that immediately, that's the whole point of a spy application. It, yep. It popped and boom, it saw, and we saw something immediately, even if we're on a slow connection. That's right. In fact, if you take a look here, this, this paragraph tag has this star ng if uh, attribute here. That's saying if we don't have any forecasts right now, mm. then show this. Gotcha. So when we do have forecasts, then show this. So there needs to be some JavaScript now that's running in the background to go get this forecasts object. Mm -hmm. which will then trigger the display of one of these two elements, either the paragraph with the loading indicator mm -hmm. or the table. So these are our views. This is, again, MVC, except it's not MVC on the server. It's MVC on the client. Right. And that's right. That's where it starts to get a little confusing, running a client-side MVC mm -hmm. on top of a server-side MVC. Gotcha. So that Angular code is sitting here in our fetch data TS, and you can see the declaration of the component. Mm -hmm. And then we define this fetch data class that has a forecast object, a collection of weather forecast interfaces, mm -hmm. and then our constructor. So when this component is um, constructed, it's going to reach out and do an HTTP GET to the API sample data weather forecasts okay, URL. So slash API slash sample data, that's the sample data controller. In our MV, MV, in our, our ASP.NET application, it's right there under controllers. That's right. Yep. So and then it's going to hit the uh, the weather forecasts. Yep, should be right there. Yep. And there point. it is. There it is. And look at that. That's returning uh, some data. It's going and doing an enumerable merge and doing some stuff, but it is effectively still returning an I enumerable of weather forecasts. Yep. And that's going to be serialized as JSON. Serialized as JSON, returned back to this class. Mm -hmm. And when it We just switched from the server to the client, though. We switched from server to client. So we were on the server-side controller. Now we're on the client-side controller. When it receives that data, mm -hmm. it punches that JSON object into that forecasts mm -hmm. property, which then uh, swaps out. It all, right? Yeah, swaps out the HTML, and we get then the grid of content. And then we have a simple for loop to go through that collection of forecasts and output the properties. Nice. Easy. Well, so, I wouldn't say it's easy, but it is definitely interesting and prescriptive. Yeah, this is this is simple, right? This is base level stuff with Angular 2 working with ASP.NET. I and think, I think the thing that's most interesting to me though is that when you went yo and put in that generator, Angular 2 wasn't the only choice. Right. There are other frameworks out there. There's, uh, I believe, React was in the list, and they're building more. There's yeah. going to be more of these things, especially as the JavaScript community continues to evolve mm -hmm. their frameworks. Another interesting thing about the work that's being done here on these SPA services is the realization that, if you remember when you did that navigation, it said loading, and then it showed the data. If you were a spider, a web spider, or the mm -hmm. very first time you hit the, the page, you would see loading, and that doesn't do you any good. Right. 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 Uh, there's that what they call the first load problem. Mm -hmm. So they're doing work in this system to go and compile that view on the server side. So that little that little dance you went where you said make some JavaScript, call the weather service, do the client. You can actually do all that work on the server. Yes. And the first view returns HTML, and then all subsequent ones are JSON. Right. If you don't support JavaScript, it will start to do that interaction. Yeah. And ASP.NET Core is well positioned to do that. And we've got a bridge now into Node. Mm -hmm. So you can have kind of the best of both worlds. You can have the C-sharp or the F-sharp language that makes you happy. Absolutely. And uh, still be able to do the cool tools 
with Node and with Webpack. Node.js, if that's what you're familiar with and you enjoy. Very cool. Yeah. Nice introduction to SPA. Yeah, I think so. All right. It's uh, just a taste. We'll have to go and so, do another MVA and get real deep into how this works. We'll have Steve Sanderson come out and we'll do an advanced one. But for now, this is the intermediate ASP.NET Core 1.0 MVA. We'll be right back.